In this organic chemistry tutorial, we're going to talk about enantiomers, diastereomers, and meso compounds. If you want to follow along with the slides and the practice problems that I'm using today, make sure you click the link in the box below. And while you're at the website, make sure you check out all the other organic chemistry resources on there. Let's get started. Molecules that are stereoisomers have the same molecular formula and the same structure, but the arrangement of their atoms in 3D space is different. So for example, all three of these molecules on the slide are stereoisomers. They're all called 4-bromo-3-chloro-cyclopentene. They all have the same molecular formula. The bromine and the chlorine are attached to the same carbon atoms in all three of the molecules. The difference is that they're pointing in different spatial directions relative to one another and to the rest of the molecule. So these are stereoisomers. So I've built models of the first two of those here so you can see, and I'll hold them up. So in this first one, you've got the double bond over here on this side, the chlorine is pointing towards you, and the bromine is pointing towards me and away from you. And then in this second one, you have the double bond on the same side, but up at the top, the chlorine is pointing towards me and away from you, and the bromine is pointing towards you and away from me. So these are stereoisomers of one another. Constitutional isomers, on the other hand, have an entirely different molecular structure. So these two molecules are constitutional isomers. They do have the same molecular formula, but the bromine is on a totally different carbon in the second molecule, and so that would give the molecule a totally different name from the first one. It's called 1-bromo-3-chlorocyclopentene. So those are constitutional isomers. Now, so far in all of my lessons on stereochemistry, we've been talking a lot about a specific class of stereoisomers called enantiomers. Enantiomers are stereoisomers that are non-superimposable, non-identical mirror images of one another. Molecules that have enantiomers are called chiral molecules. For example, this molecule is chiral. We know that because we cannot find any plane or point of symmetry in this molecule. That means it must be chiral. And it has two chirality centers. Their absolute configurations are R and R. So the full name is 3R, 4R, 4-bromo-3-chloro-cyclopentene. And the enantiomer of this molecule, which is the mirror image of the original, has the configurations S and S. So its full name is 3S, 4S, 4-bromo-3-chloro-cyclopentene. And we can tell it's a mirror image if we just simply rotate that second molecule around an axis, and then we can see clearly that it is the mirror image of the first one. So these two molecules are enantiomers of one another. We can tell that they're enantiomers, one, because we were able to turn one of them around and view it so that we could see that it's a mirror image of the first one. We also can tell that they're enantiomers because all of the configurations of all of the stereocenters have been switched. We went from RR to SS. So when you see a molecule where all of the configurations of all of the stereocenters are inverted, you are dealing with enantiomers, mirror images. We can also have a set of molecules that are stereoisomers of one another, but they are not mirror images of one another. For example, if we look at our original molecule, that 3R4R isomer, and we can compare it with this one. This one is the RS isomer the 3R4S, 4-bromo-3-chloro-cyclopentene. The only change is that on the second one, the bromine has changed from being on a dash to being on a wedge. So the configuration of the chirality center that it's attached to changed from R to S. So these two molecules are stereoisomers. They have the same formula, the same name. The only difference is the configuration of one of the chirality centers. But they aren't mirror images of one another. When we have stereoisomers that are not mirror images of one another, but they are still stereoisomers, we call them diastereomers. Other examples of diastereomers can include substituted alkenes, which have an E configuration or a Z configuration of their double bonds. So these two alkenes, the E2-butene and the Z2-butene, are diastereomers of one another. They are stereoisomers, 
but they aren't mirror images. So to sum all of that up, two molecules that are stereoisomers of one another will either be enantiomers or diastereomers. You know they're enantiomers if they're mirror images and if all of the RS configurations have changed. All of them have to swap. You know two molecules are diastereomers if they are not mirror images, and you can also tell if at least one, but not all, of the RNS configurations have changed. A key skill that you're going to need in order to pass organic chemistry is to be able to identify these relationships really quickly so you can burn through those multiple choice questions. And a really common type of multiple choice question on your exams is going to be to give you two molecules and ask you to choose the relationship between them. Are they enantiomers? Are they diastereomers? Or are they constitutional isomers like we saw at the beginning of the video? Let's do some practice identifying some of those relationships. So what is the relationship between the following two molecules? Well, both of these have chains of five carbons with a chlorine and then a bromine and then a bromine on them. It looks like the main difference between them is that on the molecule on the left, that chlorine atom is on a dashed bond pointing away from us, and on the molecule on the right, the chlorine is on a wedged bond pointing towards us. The configurations of the two bromines are the same in both molecules. So we've changed one, but not all, of the configurations of the chirality centers. We could assign R and S to all three of those on both molecules and see that we've made one change, but visually I think it's enough to say that we've changed one chirality center, but not all of them. And so that means that these compounds are diastereomers of one another. All right, so these two molecules are substituted cyclohexane rings. And it looks like they're pretty similar, but they're drawn in sort of a different orientation from one another. So why don't we rotate the second molecule around a point in the middle? If we do that, then we can put both CH3 groups up on the top of the molecule and maybe we can compare them better. All right, so when we do that, we have a CH3 up at the top still on a wedge pointing towards us, and then we have an OH, two carbons away from that CH3, and it's also on a wedge pointing towards us. So it looks like the difference between the first molecule and the second molecule is that the configurations of both of those chirality centers have been swapped. In the first molecule, they're both on dashes pointing away from us, and on the second molecule, they're both on wedges pointing towards us. So it looks like we've swapped both, so these are probably enantiomers of one another. If you took the time to assign the RNS configurations to each of these chirality centers, you would also find that they have swapped. Another way that we could see this is if we had drawn an axis in the middle of the second molecule this way and flipped it over. Then we could clearly see that these two molecules are mirror images of one another. So these are indeed enantiomers. All right, the third problem. What's the relationship between the following two molecules? Well, this one is trying to trick us because it's trying to draw our attention to the top carbon on both of the molecules, which are chirality centers in both cases. But if we really have a look, we can see that the right-hand side, we've got one, two, three, four, five carbons in a chain, and the OH is on the second carbon. And in the right-hand side molecule, we've got one, two, three, four, five carbons in a chain, but the OH is on the first carbon. So they are constitutional isomers. They're connected differently. OH is on a different carbon in either case. So it doesn't actually matter what the stereochemistry of those chirality centers are. They're actually different molecules, constitutional isomers. When we have a molecule with N chirality centers, there will always be two to the power of N possible stereoisomers that we can generate. So for example, this molecule here has two chirality centers, one here on the carbon with the chlorine attached and another one here on the carbon with the OH attached. 
if you took the time to assign the configuration to those chirality centers, you would get R and S. And so let's generate the rest of the possible stereoisomers for this molecule. If we swapped the absolute configuration of both of those chirality centers, we would get an isomer with the S configuration and the R configuration respectively, and that would be the enantiomer of this molecule. Remember when we switch both, we get the enantiomer. If we switched the configuration of just one of those chirality centers, so let's say we switch on the OH carbon, the S, and generate the R there, but keep the R the same on the chlorine carbon, we would get a diastereomer. So this would be the R-R isomer. It's a diastereomer of our original one. It's also a diastereomer of this one. And then if we take the RR isomer and we generate the mirror image of that one by changing both chirality centers, so we get the SS, that is the enantiomer of this one, and it's also a diastereomer of the other two. So that's all our possible stereoisomers. Now sometimes when you're generating all these possible stereoisomers, you're going to come across some that end up having a plane of symmetry, and so they are going to be achiral. They are going to be identical to their mirror image, and this will result in fewer total stereoisomers than the predicted 2 to the power of n number. So here's another example. We have this five-membered ring with two methyl groups. This one is the RR isomer. Its mirror image is the SS isomer. Those two are enantiomers of one another. If we change the second R to an S, we would get the RS isomer. That's a di diastereomer of both of those first ones. But if we generate the mirror image of this RS isomer, if we generate its enantiomer by changing both chirality centers, we get the SR. And if we look closely at the RS and the SR, we realize that they have a plane of symmetry. And so these are not chiral. So they actually can't have an enantiomer. And if we, for example, turn around our second isomer down here, just rotated it around this axis, we actually get a superimposed exact same molecule as the first one. So this is what we call a meso compound. A meso compound is a stereoisomer that ends up being achiral, and so it doesn't have a mirror image. An important thing to remember when you're studying is that meso isn't one of the relationships. Meso just describes the type of compound it is. A meso compound and its mirror image are the same. They are identical. That's the relationship. And meso describes an achiral molecule that has chirality centers. So for example, these two molecules here below, they are the same. The relationship between the two of them is that they are the same, they are identical. And we would describe this one compound as a meso compound. So this is a meso compound, this is a meso compound, they are the same thing. So here's another meso compound. So if we rotate around this bond, we can rotate the OH group so that it is pointing to the back just like the other one, and then we can see that this molecule does have an internal plane of symmetry, so it must be achiral. We can do the same with the second one, and we end up with the exact same molecule. So these two compounds are identical, that's their relationship, and it is a meso compound. So here is another practice problem that we can do. We're going to sort the molecule pairs according to their relationship to one another. So the possible relationships are enantiomers, identical molecules, diastereomers, or constitutional isomers. So let's start with the top two molecules here. All right, so this one has a seven-membered ring, and then it has a methyl group on a wedge, so pointing out at our face. And the second one, also a seven-membered ring and a methyl group on a dash pointing away from us. And so at first glance we might think, oh, these are enantiomers because we've, you know, switched a wedge to a dash, but you have to be careful with that because this molecule, it's not chiral, right? So both sides of the ring are exactly the same, so there are not four different groups attached to that top carbon. So this is an achiral molecule, 
And indeed, if we turn the second one around 180 degrees, we would generate the first one. So these are actually identical. So we'll move them into the identical box. All right, next, we just have some names. So first we have 2R, 3R, 4S, 2-fluoro, 4-methyl, 3-hexanol. What a mouthful. And the next one is 2S, 3S, and 4R. 2-fluoro, 4-methyl, 3-hexanol. So the root name is the same. The fluoro and the methyl and the alcohol are all on the same carbons. In each case, we don't even need to draw this molecule. We just need to look at the configurations of the chirality centers. So the first one is 2R, 3R, and 4S. The second one is 2S, 3S, and 4R. So all three of them have been swapped. When you swap all chirality centers, you generate the enantiomer. So we'll move that one to the enantiomers box. All right, what about this molecule down here? So again, this one is trying to trick us by drawing our attention to a chirality center on that left-hand carbon. But if we really take a look, we can see that the double bond has a different configuration in both cases. So this double bond is trans, or E, and the other double bond is cis, or Z. And so automatically you know that if you have alkenes with two different configurations, they are diastereomers of one another. So those are diastereomers. And then finally, that leaves us with molecules that are probably constitutional isomers, but I didn't say that one goes in each box, so let's take a look at them just to be sure. So they're both five-membered rings. They both have a methyl group on a wedge, but if you look closely, you can see that the methyl group and the double bond are different distances away from one another in each of these two molecules. So that is a constitutional isomer. The connection between the atoms and the bonds are different. They're put together differently. So that's a constitutional isomer. Thanks for studying with me and making it all the way to the end of the video. I hope that this helped you understand the difference between enantiomers, diastereomers, constitutional isomers, and helped you understand what a miso compound is. And if you liked this, give the video a thumbs up so more people can find it and check out the website if you want more resources and more fun problems like this. Happy studying!